Hello, everyone, and welcome to the COVID-19 Mitigation Strategies in Pediatric Rare Disease Clinical Trials works Virtual Workshop. My name is Lindsay Murray, and I'm the Associate Director of the PRO Consortium, as well as the moderator for today's workshop, which is a joint presentation from member representatives of the PRO Consortium's Rare Disease Subcommittee. So not a joint presentation, it is a presentation. From <laughs> so I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started, um, so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, your line will be muted to reduce background noise and video will be disabled to prevent impacting the bandwidth of our presenters and attendees. And you will have the opportunity to submit questions for today's workshop during the question and answer session at the end of our time today, um, where, where you can please raise your hand and a moderator will call on you. And then when you are called, uh, the host will unmute you. After you hear two beeps, you may ask your question. Uh, we will be recording today's presentation along with the slides. Uh, this recording will be made available on the CPATH website and on the PRO Consortium web, web page. Feel free to share it with your colleagues who were unable to join us today. Uh, we do want to, inc we've included a funding acknowledgement here for CPATH as well as the PRO Consortium specifically and the Rare Disease Subcommittee. And we do want to include our disclaimer statement here, which is just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed in the following slides are those of the individual presenters and should not be attributed to their respective organizations, companies, the US Food and Drug Administration or Critical Path Institute. So now I would like to introduce today's presenters. So if all of my presenters could please turn your cameras on. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined today by Don Phillips, who's the Director of Clinical Sci and Clinical Scientist for Outcomes Research at Regenix Bio, as well as Adam Shaywitz, who's the Chief Medical Officer at Bridge Biogene Therapy. We're also joined by Kiara Berggren, who's a research speech language pathologist in the Department of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Heather Adams is an Associate Professor in the Department of Neurology, Division of Child Neurology, at the University of Rochester Medical Center, Julie Eisengart, who's a pediatric neuropsychologist and assist, assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Minnesota, serving as director of the UMN Neurodevelopmental Program in Rare Disease. So thank you all for joining. I'm going to ask everyone to turn their cameras off now for the duration of the presentation, and then we'll turn them back on again for the Q&A section at the end. So the agenda for today will be to provide you with an introduction to the Critical Path Institute, or CPATH, and our work establishing the Rare Disease COA Consortium. Then we'll move into the focus of our workshop, which is namely the COVID-19 mitigation strategies in pediatric rare disease clinical trials. You'll hear perspectives from two sponsor representatives, as well as three practicing clinicians on how the pandemic has impacted clinical trial conduct and assessment strategies. In case this is the first time you are hearing about the Critical Path Institute, or CPATH, and the Patient Reported Outcome, or PRO Consortium, we would like to provide you with some background about who we are and what we do. CPATH is an independent, nonprofit organization which aims to accelerate medical product development through creating standards and drug development tools that aid in the scientific evaluation of the efficacy and safety of new therapies. CPATH is a pu public private partnership which receives funding from the US FDA as well as non-governmental sources. The PRO consortium is uh, formed of members who are pharmaceutical firms that, that work pre-competitively in collaboration with CPATH, FDA, and other government agencies and patient organizations on the qualification of publicly available COAs for use in clinical trials where COA-based endpoints are used to support product labeling claims. In order to address the challenge of selecting appropriate outcome measures for use in clinical trials focused on rare diseases, FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research funded a cooperative agreement to establish the Rare Disease COA Consortium. A one-year grant was awarded to CPATH with the National Organization for Rare Disorders as a subawardee on September 1st, 2019. 
a no cost extension was approved on July 17, 2019, extending funding through August 31, 2021. The specific aim of this funding opportunity was to establish a rare disease consortium focused on identifying COAs that could be implemented across multiple rare diseases and in clinical trials. Once established, the final outcome would be the creation of a common resource describing publicly available fit for purpose clinical outcome assessments, as well as accompanying information such as the populations for use and the strengths and limitations of each tool. The first step taken toward the establishment of the new consortium was the creation of the rare disease subcommittee within CPATH's PRO consortium. The PRO consortium serves as an incubator for the maturation of the pre-competitive multi-stakeholder consortium within CPATH's COA program. Monthly rare disease subcommittee calls have been ongoing since November of 2019 and plans to launch the rare disease COA consortium later this summer are underway. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the rare disease subcommittee members who have participated in this initiative up to now. We started the rare disease subcommittee with our partners at NORD, nine PRO consortium members and representatives from the National Institutes of Health, National Center for Advancing Translation Sciences and Patient-Centered Outcomes Research. Subsequently, we have expanded to include an additional 25 advisory members, as well as three clinical experts who have been instrumental at providing us perspective from in the trenches on implementing COAs in pediatric rare disease populations. And last, but certainly not least, I cannot emphasize enough how much the ongoing FDA support we've received has helped shape this effort with representatives from across CEDAR providing insight and guidance on every aspect of this initiative. Members of the Rare Disease Subcommittee, including representatives from FDA, CPATH, NORD, NCATS, and PCORI, um, as well as the biopharmaceutical firms initially involved, made some initial decisions that efforts would be focused on pediatric populations, that we would tackle oncology and subsequent um, efforts, and that we would take a domain approach to identify COAs that might be fit for purpose for uses and measures in treatment trials for multiple rare diseases. And the first domain of interest that was identified was daily function. The Rare Disease Subcommittee and ultimately the Rare Disease COA Consortium will collaborate on activities related to furthering the development of the Rare Disease COA resource, as well as tackling methodologic challenges faced in rare disease research and ensuring the patient perspective is incorporated into our work. This workshop is the result of one of those efforts to collectively address the impact of the pandemic on rare disease pediatric clinical trial programs. So with that, I'm going to move on to the focus of today's presentation. Uh, we will start with an overview of the challenges created by COVID-19 and the ensuing pandemic restrictions. These issues are likely to persist for longer in pediatric populations where vaccination options aren't readily available yet. We also want to note that the pandemic has exacerbated larger social political issues, and we won't be addressing those issues specifically today, but did want to acknowledge them. The focus of this workshop will be limited to issues specifically related to the challenges with conducting in-person and remote assessments in pediatric rare disease clinical trial settings. So the objectives of today's workshop will be to identify challenges to conducting pediatric rare disease clinical trials posed by COVID. We'll present a range of strategies aimed at limiting the impact of COVID-19 on the conduct of pediatric rare disease clinical trials. We'll present a range of mitigation strategies aimed at safely and successfully conducting in-person and remote assessments under pandemic conditions and we'll provide an interactive forum for idea sharing related to COVID-19 impact and mitigation strategies across a variety of stakeholders. Um, in addition to the materials presented today, the team has generated what we think is a fairly comprehensive table of challenges and implementation strategies across the lifespan of a clinical trial. This document will be posted on the CPATH PRO Consortium website as a resource for those interested. With that, I'm going to hand things over to our first presenters, um, Adam Shaywitz and Don Phillips. <laughs> 
great. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and this is Adam uh, and Don will be following. Uh, I'm the chief medical officer at Bridge Bio Gene Therapy, um, and we're developing treatments for, for rare genetically driven diseases. So we think about these kinds of issues on a regular basis, and it's just been such an honor and, and pleasure to be part of, of this cross-functional group here um, and, and very enlightening discussions and also a great opportunity to kind of share a lot of things that, that we've all sort of had to deal with over the past year. Um, so just as, as a little introduction, I'll be focusing on impacts of COVID at the level of study site and, and personnel at the study site. And Don, who will follow, will focus on impacts of COVID on patients, caregivers, and, and study data. We'll both talk as well about not only the impact, but also, as, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, a focus on mitigation strategies that, that we and, and colleagues and a number of other sponsors and, and groups that think about this a lot have developed to try to address these, these challenges and impacts. And I just want to stress that what we are presenting should really not be thought of as a final word at all, but really as an evolving work in progress and, and thought process. It's really meant to provide examples of the range of activities, the range of processes and, and people involved in, in study execution that could be impacted by COVID um, and, and just some of the ways that we and others have started to, to think about addressing these impacts. So when we think about impact at the level of the study and study site and personnel, you can almost think chronologically about all the steps of study startup from submitting to IRB all the way through the assessments that you're um, collecting. And here is just a sort of smattering of, of some of the steps along that chronological process that a number of us have encountered challenges on uh, over the past year with COVID, starting very early on with you know, prioritization at the level of the IRBs. So there were IRBs, many IRBs were not even considering taking protocols that weren't related to COVID studies. And then there were other IRBs that were only taking uh, protocols related to interventional versus natural history studies. So even at that very early stage, there was an impact on, on um, on potential impact on the study, at least at some sites. We had to think about training. You know, we all used to in-person site initiation visit, training, those types of discussions. Um, and really we had to, 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 to pivot significantly there. Um, this is sort of coupled with the time constraints and, and competing interest of the people at the site this involves, you know, a lot of the physicians that we all work with were kind of drafted into working in the COVID wards uh, full time. And so they, you know, we, there were uh, physicians who we work with who hadn't been in ICUs and had to work in ICUs and were completely, you know, they, they're, they, they had no time to deal with study related issues. So we had to kind of uh, incorporate those challenges. There were personnel at the site that were impacted directly by COVID, exposed to COVID, um, developed uh, COVID. So th these were all things that, that were really new and we, we had to try to find ways to sort of work around. Um, even with enrollment and recruitment, we now, and you know, this is something that will continue, is how do we think about COVID um, as something that could infect, uh, could affect, sorry, Freudian slip there, could affect uh, inclusion into the study um, is this something that the sponsor should be thinking about? How does the sponsor work with the local uh, institutions about this? Um, so that's uh, yet another element of study startup and 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 the initiation of a study that is impacted by COVID. And finally, at the level of you know just the clinical outcome assessments themselves and administration of these assessments um, from an administrative point of view, uh, 
I think all of us that were, you know, had studies going on, we just had a slew of, of protocol deviations. We couldn't do these assessments. So huge amount of protocol deviations. How do you kind of deal with 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 the huge gap? And, and then we'll talk about ways that we try to get around that. And then if you were able to administer clinical outcome assessments, let's say uh, a child was able to come into the clinic, but the rater now has to wear a mask and a gown, things like that, a shield, how does that impact the administration and the results that you get and how do you document that? So all of these some kind of very high level impact to very logistical tactical impacts were, were all things that we had to try to, to deal with. And so some of the mitigation strategies, and again, this is really not all encompassing, but just an example of, of some of the ways that some of us try to deal with this. Um, so we talked about not being able to have meetings and site initiation visits in real time. Um, well, you know, everybody's on Zoom these days. So we, we try to, you know, well, we, we needed to basically have initiation visits by webinar. Um, we also needed to develop training resources for the site that were really geared more towards um, remote training versus in-person training. How do you train people as well on devices, things like that, if you can't, if people can't tangibly feel a new type of device that you're using or feel some of the um, uh, uh, manipulatives that you're using. So they're trying to, to shift in that way as well. Um, for the clinical outcome assessments, and I'll talk about this briefly in a little bit, uh, a number of us had to pivot to remote assessments, um, had to develop uh, assessments or ways of assessing that could be rigorous um, and still get useful information, but remotely. Um, and, and how do you do it? How do you show that you're doing it rigorously? How do you do it in a way that doesn't provide too much burden on, on caregivers and on patients? Um, <clears throat> that also takes a lot of thought as well as a lot of logistical ex uh, uh, execution. Um, one of the things that I think, again, we, we've all kind of, or many of us probably have seen over the past year is that uh, as we've all moved towards remote meetings, we, we all just have to take this flexible approach where we're not going to go to a meeting in person or we might not be able to do that for a while. How do we get people together um, in an effective way remotely? whether it's advisors for an advisory board or caregivers and patients for a focus group and still have that same type of real intimate connection that I think produces valuable discussion and allows mutual understanding. So that, that's also a challenge, but as I'll, as I'll mention, I think there's a benefit to that as well that we've seen emerge. Um, and then finally, at a more tactical level, uh, the source documents, we need to include a lot more flexibility around unscheduled visits. We need to, as I mentioned before, document and allow for documentation and capturing of things that we might not have thought about before. Is the, is the assessment using a mask or a shield? And then we can go back and see, did, are the mask visits different? Um, in, is, is, is there any difference in assessments that were done via uh, you know, mask or, or shield between the reader and, and the, 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 the child or the patient. So, you know, I, I mentioned briefly, but just to highlight, I think it's a double-edged sword. There's challenges here, but what we've developed, I think, going to and adapting to the challenges of COVID is there is a long-term benefit um, of of migrating to um, a way of thinking that will allow for um, for assessments and interactions that don't necessarily need to be tied to a specific geography or location. So, for example, um, if we can do assessments at home and can do it in a rigorous way that doesn't provide um, you know a lot of new burden for families, that that's a huge win for both. Um, the sponsor as well as the families, you decrease the burden on the families and the patient. They don't have to travel into a hospital if you can find a way to do it well. Um, and also you can potentially allow for inclusion of, of a larger, more diverse study population that may not be 
restricted to people who are able to kind of travel to a particular uh, institution. Um, the advisory boards and focus groups, I, I know that um, our group in particular, we, we noticed that it was actually much easier to have these advisory boards uh, and get people together online than it was to get people together uh, in person. I think, you know, you do, there are things that you miss from the in-person interaction um, and you do your best to try to figure out ways around that. But it also, I think, allows for, for better, more convenient um, sharing of uh, information. And again, there are a number of uh, efficiencies here too, right? Um, you have reduced costs for training, these focus groups, the travel. Um, you even might be able to have a expert at a tertiary care center be able to remotely assess people in many locations um, and, and there can be efficiencies there as well. So I just wanna wrap up my part of this before I hand over to Don to kind of briefly describe a case from um, our own personal experience uh, at Bridge Biogen Therapy where we, we had a natural history study that was underway. It started a few months before COVID hit. Uh, this was a natural history study for a rare, rapidly progressive neurodegenerative disease where we had put a lot of time and thought into training um, raters for neurodevelopment exams um, and sending them out in the field to family homes and do um, assessments there. And the major assessments we were using might be familiar to, to some of you, um, a modified form of the Hammersmith, the growth motor function measure, um, the TIMSI, uh, the Bally, and then milestones from the CDC. And we, we had a whole plan on how to do this. We had uh, our physical therapists or raters were trained in a very rigorous way and then people couldn't travel. We, we, we didn't want um, to expose our, our families and children who are vulnerable to COVID. We, we couldn't make our, our raiders who you know, travel. So we had to adapt very quickly if we wanted to be able to gather natural history data. And the same would occur on a treatment study as well. But we're, I'll, I'll just run through sort of some of our, our thinking and what emerged from this. So, the first step was to kind of do an in-depth review of these outcomes that we were doing in person and try to think about which ones would be most amenable to remote assessments. And this is really something that just, you have to have the right people in the room, uh, the people that know the exams, the people that understand how they're done um, in a very granular way to understand which elements of these tests you could do by an iPad with a remote um, rater in another location and the caregiver sets up the iPad and positions it correctly um, so that the remote rater can kind of uh, ask the caregiver how to position the child. Um, so these are things that, you know, I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but it does take some time. Um, and you have, we had to establish a family kit of manipulatives and toys for those of you who are familiar with a lot of these tests, they involve the, the assessor giving toys to the child and asking them to do things or hold them or having the child track movement of objects, mailing iPads with tripods to the caregivers and the families, and then finally making sure that this whole remote platform is HIPAA compliant. Um, and then we, what we did is we executed a pilot study before we rolled it out completely to kind of understand where the kinks were in the system, what was working and what wasn't. We were very fortunate and grateful for seven families who participated in this pilot study and provided feedback that was then incorporated um, into what became a successful pilot and now is being rolled out uh, fully in the US and um, now, in another geography in Europe, we're doing the same thing um, to, to, to pilot the remote and uh, understanding what the challenges are there, if they're any different, um, and then hopefully very soon being able to, to roll that out fully there. Um, and importantly, all caregiver and parent-facing materials had to be IRB, uh, IRB and Ethics Committee approved, translated for different geographies. So a number of different things that go on here, uh, just to give you a taste. So without further ado, I will pass on to my colleague, Don. Uh, 
Hi, um, my name is Dawn Phillips. I'm a director in outcomes research at Regenix Bio. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to share some of the learnings um, that we had from our really nice interactive discussions related to the impact and the possible mitigation strategies for, for COVID-19. So I'm going to focus here on, on the next couple slides on the trial contact conduct impacts as they relate to caregivers and patients. And so, as Lindsay um, already stated, I think it's it's really important to consider when we when we look at caregivers and patients is that adults now in America have access to vaccines, but our pediatric challenges are going to persist for some time. And many of our our rare diseases that we're studying are on pediatrics are in pediatrics with very young children. And so the first really important point here is restricted or modified travel to clinical sites to participate in studies um, and reduced airline travel specifically. And then the next point really speaks to the idea that we have um, improved COVID situations in America somewhat. But many of our pediatric rare disease clinical trials have an international site distribution. And we have to be really thoughtful related to the impact of that um, across the board. And so it's much more difficult now for some of the children that may have traveled to the United States to participate in a clinical trial due to country or state mandated prohibitions um, from some regions. Um, there's also the next point is really important to consider, and that's the potential developmental impact of COVID. And uh, many of the rare diseases we study have um, multi-system impacts and neurodevelopmental um, challenges the children have. And so, and the children per participated pre-COVID in multiple therapies, um, like physical therapy, occupational, and speech therapy. And so when we surveyed some of our families, we found out that they had restricted or no access to these therapies, and they also had reduced educational support. And so the families were um, really experiencing a lot of constraints here. They were already, um, many of them, working from home, and they also had the increased educational needs of their other children in doing um, their schooling. And so there was a lot of developmental impact there. In addition, um, having a child that has special challenges is already um, produces with produces some constraints and stresses for families. And in addition to that, they some of the families at our clinical sites had to do regular COVID testing to enter the facilities. And they now had a restricted number of people that were allowed to be in attendance during um, the developmental testing for the clinical outcome assessments or just re during regular standard of care treatment. Um, so that's an additional challenge for these families, especially if their children are presenting uh, with behavioral or attentional or cognitive challenges. And it's much easier to manage some of that if you have both parents or other supportive family members um, in attendance. So, um, and then the last point just points to additional financial burdens like all families are experiencing um, and that that is another impact on, on our trial conduct. So next slide, please. Sorry, it hasn't moved yet. Can you advance the slides? Still hasn't advanced to me. John, I think you can you can do oh, it. Oh, I'm supposed to advance them. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Gosh. And we practice that too. All right. So mitigation um, strategies just provide a wide range of travel options. So uh, we had families that rented an RV and they traveled uh, longer distances to get to the site. Families traveled earlier, which was really important to adapt to either a 10 day or 14 day quarantine period in some places. And um, the last point is really important. So we uh, created additional caregiver questionnaires to capture the impact of reduced therapy um, and academic services. So 
the first thing you have to do is quantify the number of therapy visits that they were participating in pre-COVID, and then you want to compare those to what their participation levels were um, during the last 12 months. So that will at least allow us to do a comparison of what has changed related to those therapy services. But it is important to note that this did require a protocol amendment and IRB approval. Um, the next thing I'm going to look at is um, the impact on study data. So, you know, we have a lot of creative strategies that were developed related to re remote or in-person assessments, but we really have lack of comparability data uh, to understand the variability that may be present. Um, even though we can collect um, that the children experienced reduced therapy participation, uh, we have lack of analysis strategies to really deal with how this should be interpreted as a confounding variable um, in our efficacy outcomes. Um, several sites had challenges related to in-person. Uh, they, they were restricted in their ability to do electronic data monitoring, monitoring and were only able to do in-person. And that all comes together to really impact those timelines. So, um, we all have swim lanes that are developed related to when we're going to do um, our data locks and what our plans are related to dissemination. And many of those things needed to be modified um, because we had missing data. Um, and this put also a tremendous stress on our statisticians related to last minute data coming in and having to create new figures. Um, and to work on our abstracts at the last moment in order to disseminate some of our, our really important study results. So, what are some of the mitigation strategies? So, if you have the opportunity to do video assessments, you can reduce some of your potential bias um, through central scoring of videos. So, if you have videos that can be scored, um, you can use multiple raters and um, reduce some of the bias there. I think this is most easily done in motor disorders and is a little bit more challenging if you're doing some of the neurocognitive assessments. Um, we also have had some great mitigation strategies related to use of expert clinicians over Zoom to really support assessments in real time. Uh, that's been a tremendous support, I think. Um, it's important to use vendors with extensive clinical metric uh, experience. And you can also take a look at some of your video in-person assessment data and look at what the, how, what the relationship is between that data and some of your parent proxy patient reported outcome data that covers the same type of daily activities in the home to add one more layer of validity and to look at um, how the parents rated dressing and or feeding and how you were able to capture some of that um, daily activity information um, in videos in the home environment. And we also um, had to develop analysis strategies to deal with off schedule visits. So you may have to change your acceptable windows for assessments um, and what you had planned as your initial analysis strategy. So I now will pass it over to the next team to give us some really great um, detail for in-person and remote formats. Thank you, Dawn. So this is Julie Eisengard, and I'm going to be speaking with my colleagues, uh, Heather Adams and Kira Bergren um, about uh, the assessments during the pandemic. And we're really um, approaching this with a very practical feet on the ground. Um, the, the complications and some sort of practical things that we've uh, as a group talked about in terms of mitigation strategies for these assessments. So first we're gonna discuss the in-person assessments. And what I wanna to present to you is a picture of how things used to look, right? This is a really concrete demonstration of how these assessments came across. Anyone can look at this picture and know that this child is happily engaged in the assessment, having a good time. And I think that this is a really important concrete picture for people to think about because more than any other kind of data collection for pediatric uh, rare conditions, the assessments that elicit behaviors or try to 
detect skills or uh, quantify challenges are so dependent on the child to perform or to demonstrate or to show or not to show. And the younger they go or the more sort of developmentally impacted they are, the more sensitive they are to the conditions. And so then if I advance to the next slide and show what COVID safe testing looks like these days, you can instantly see the dramatic change for an in-person assessment. We know that this child is well engaged, but compared to the previous picture, we have a lot less information about her. But my colleague Kira is gonna be talking more about the PPE, the personal protective equipment, but I thought that this was a really concrete demonstration. And even more so if we look at the um, the before and after, right? On the left-hand side, we see how things used to look. These are what our assessments, this is a neuropsychological assessment. Um, it's a sort of a, a preschool um, IQ test, if you will. Um, both the examiner and the child can benefit from each other's facial expressions, um, reading each other, seeing those subtle differences. Whereas on the right, um, COVID safe testing, we have people very practically um, physically blocked from complete quote unquote normal human engagement. Um, and yet we're still requiring um, the, the behaviors and engagement um, to be um, elicited from this child and, and as fully um, sort of realized as possible. So let's start with um, talking about the study space and we'll kind of close in on the the face to face in a moment but covid has really uh, imposed limitations on the physical space and the engagement so there are a lot of concerns with um, really the, the the distancing right how can we distance in a physical space um, some of the clinic sites have had decreased capacity some of their areas have been repurposed for various covid needs um, there are also uh, strategies to reduce crowding in lobbies, whereas multiple participants could be seen at a time or um, multiple children could be seen in a clinic for clinical care at a time in the past. That becomes uh, less and less practical when we're trying to create those COVID distance strategies. There are also access limitations. So again, with reducing the number of bodies um, and exposures, um, you know, regulations around not bringing siblings or only bringing one caregiver or one family member. Also, even things like elevators um, when there are <clears throat> disease related mobility impacts or even disease related uh, fatigue or <clears throat> the needs of family members. Uh, using elevators, right? Elevators are um, a key place to close in individuals. And so um, there are there are needs to address. Um, the, the limitations that are put on that. Also, face-to-face -face time. Those are different from site to site. Uh, in conversing with our colleagues, we've heard that, um, you know, particularly in the beginning and the height of the, the pandemic, there were a lot of concerns about closing people into a room for these face-to-face -face exams. They were putting time caps, 90 minutes, 120 minutes to try to get all of these things done. So what were some of the strategies that we used to mitigate these? One of them, so you can see here in this photo, um, at the University of Minnesota, what we did was to eliminate the concern for a lobby. We started giving patients and uh, participants two rooms per family. So there was a room for the assessment and there's a room for the family to wait, like their own private lobby. Um, and you can see that we do that now. Our, our clinic is designed to see you know, many patients and then all the families together in a big, beautiful lobby that's gone away. And so these um, these paper posts are put up every day in our clinic to assign um, families to paired rooms. We, um, we wipe them out and we rewrite room numbers if we actually need to change because, you know, a proportion of our rooms have, for example, a two way mirror and maybe we want to rearrange according to um, patient needs. So um, that's one of the ways that we reduce the, those lobby concerns. Um, even before arriving to our clinic, families uh, 
receive a detailed description of um, what they can expect. And this is something that um, my colleagues also expressed when we were all talking as a group in these committees um, about providing detailed descriptions of the kinds of things that they might expect, the safety protocols that are adhered to, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll be adhering to as well. Um, Further, some sites are providing childcare to siblings in separate areas, again, to reduce that crowding. Um, we also pre-plan assessments. Um, others are pre-planning assessments um, to comply if there are those face-to-face in-room time caps. So if it seems that you know, a child is taking a long time or if there are components of the test that um, the assessment that actually don't need physical face-to-face, -face, sometimes we can do those in um, separate rooms while on the same site. So for example, um, there's a, the adaptive measure, the Vineland, which is really a parent interview. Rather than extending the face-to-face -face time by sitting in a room with the parents and asking them the questions, we actually can do it by phone um, from one room to the other uh, as, as ways to mitigate that face-to-face -face time cap. In terms of elevator usage, there are other uh, strategies as well. One of them is just plain old forgiveness and flexibility with arrival time in case there is a backlog with the elevator and certainly signage in the elevator is really important so that people understand what the caps are um, to keep people safe. And we've all seen those X's on the floor that are sort of universal now to maintain social distance. So we'll be discussing a little bit more and I will hand off to Kira. Great. Thank you, Julie. Um, so as part of our discussion in our larger group, we were realizing that there were definitely these areas we needed to drill down in. Um, and one of them was around study personnel as well. And Adam touched on this for uh, um, a, a bit also. But one of the things that really came up to light or came to light was the idea of just needing more time, time for everything in, in these studies um, and time for that training piece uh, and really considering the idea of remote training where possible um, and recognizing that um, given the sort of fluctuating pandemic situation and people maybe being repurposed to other positions within the hospital, things like that, that we may be having some inconsistent raters for our clinical or excuse me, clinician reported outcomes and performance outcomes. Um, and these are definitely things that are going to impact um, the data that we get out of these studies. So um, around the idea of sort of mitigating this issue is making sure we really have very clear training objectives uh, as we train our clinical evaluators and our clinical research coordinators and, and other study personnel. Um, if possible, if the budget allows using um, a contract research organization that it can provide some of these virtual trainings as has already been discussed, you know, we used to all get together for these trainings and, and maybe once a year go through as a group and, and discuss nuances around what we're finding with these study visits that we need to kind of tweak as a group um, of clinical evaluators. And that's just not as feasible anymore. Um, and so uh, if we can do through a contract research organization, that would be wonderful um, if, as I said, if the budget allows having more time for these trainings, especially if it is in a virtual setting. Um, the, the technology piece, while we're all getting fairly adept at, at WebEx and Zoom and FaceTime and all the things, um, it's just taking more time for everything. Uh, and for many um, ways to sort of check off competency, we might bring in a test subject that is a representative person within the rare disease population that we're studying, and that may not be feasible. So having some flexibility around who is used as a test subject, um, and maybe um, in addition to that, having the clinical evaluator trained test off with competency, but then also have the trainer watch some recorded initial assessments for review to ensure that we're really sort of um, providing the evaluation in a standardized way, um, given the constraints that we've got with the pandemic and, and provision of training. Um, 
So hopefully this will help ensure that standardized rating for everybody. Uh, as Julie mentioned, the, the PPE, I think this has been the big one, this personal protective equipment and sort of the, the ramifications of this. Um, you can see a lovely picture here of an evaluator wearing his PPE and working with this young man. Um, and, but as Julie made a mention of, you know, we're, we're having these limitations of not having that sort of personal interaction anymore. Some individuals maybe have some craniofacial abnormalities or have some respiratory restrictions and so that using PPE just isn't feasible um, or maybe they, they just aren't able to wear it in the way that would work as to be as protective. Um, and so mitigating some of that is or be mindful of that is of concern. Certainly, as the pandemic continues to progress, uh, as Don mentioned, in the US, things are looking a little bit better, things are relaxing a little bit more, but uh, I'm sure many of us on this workshop today are participating in multi-site studies and studies with partner sites uh, across borders and can look very different in other places. Um, and even within a single country, different uh, regions of the country may be in various stages of lockdown or more openness, um, and that may impact the, the study site as well. And so there can be variations within country. Um, sort of the corollary along with the PPE piece is that disinfection piece. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, but um, you know, the room itself, as well as any of the, the items that might be in use. Uh, so, you know, if you're using a paper manual um, for something, that that's something that you need to consider um, how we're gonna do disinfection. So ideas around mitigation for this topic that we discussed as a, as a group um, in developing this workshop. And again, as, as my colleagues on this workshop have iterated, um, we, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list and we're all very much looking forward to the discussion at the end as well to hear other ideas. Um, but certainly for PPE itself, developing standards that can be applied across all sites Hopefully that there's availability for the PPE as well. Um, that certainly was an area of concern early on in the pandemic um, and may also vary by country. Um, having a, a place to document, I think Adam mentioned this as well, being what's being worn and by whom. Um, and for some of the children who maybe have not been out of the home since the pandemic started or have had li limited interaction with people in full PPE, um, showing the child, you know, introducing the child to the examiner um, where in a situation where it can be unmasked, whether it's somebody outside the room um, or, you know, in, as Julie mentioned, having rooms that have uh, two way or one way mirrors so you can see through or one way glass so you can see through there um, can at least show the child that this is a human being behind there. Um, and, and may help sort of mitigate some of the anxiety around that. Um, some activities, some assessments may or may not be able to be conducted due to limitations around PPE or site restrictions. Um, certainly uh, some sites have had restrictions around doing respiratory assessments early on in the setting of COVID. Um, so that is definitely something that would need to be documented. Um, Additional spacing, as Julie was mentioning, the two room system that she's using uh, at, at her site is a great uh, solution for that. But even if you have to be in the same room, maybe using a plexiglass shield that you can have. Um, as a speech language pathologist, my job is often feeding these children and, and watching how eating is going or speaking. And I need to have the child unmasked during that. And so there needs to be sort of other mitigation strategies around um, uh, containing as best as possible. Um, you perhaps using a negative pressure room um, and uh, using additional PPE for the clinical evaluators. Um, it, it feels a little bit like a spacesuit going in sometimes, but um, being able to protect everybody with additional PPE is very important. Um, and certainly having a, a very clear protocol for how we're going to clean and disinfect that space. And, you know, any manipulatives that were used, especially in um, uh, 
physical therapy or um, neuropsychological testing that can either be cleaned or disposed of. I know many assessment tools maybe have soft toys or cloths or things like that. Um, and, you know, having it, taking that extra moment uh, to really think about how we're going to clean these safely um, and or do we just need to dispose of things that we haven't maybe historically thought of as disposable. Um, and again, to kind of touch base again on the travel piece, getting to the site, um, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, different sites, different parts of the world are having um, differing degrees of lockdown and that's varying temporally as well. So what, what may be happening at one site this month may not be happening at that same site the next month. And so having some flexibility around when people can travel um, and maybe traveling off peak. Um, if they need to fly to a given site may be helpful. Uh, many sites are also requiring COVID-19 testing specifically before doing anything um, with like respiratory assessments or things like that. Uh, and that may be very limited in a local sense, but there are in-home test kits that can be sent now to families uh, or if somebody is fairly local to the study site, perhaps having some testing appointment slots that are protected at the site um, that study participants can go to and um, be assured that they can get right in and get right out. Um, certainly in a moment, my, our colleague Heather is gonna talk about the remote assessment piece, but considering those remote assessments or possibly if you can have a local clinical evaluator or somebody that can pop out to the home and maybe do a respiratory assessment or, or something like that, so. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to our colleague, Heather, to talk a little more in depth about the remote assessments. Thank you so much, Kira, and thank you, Julie. So, like Julie, I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist and I do work in rare diseases. And pretty much most of my neuropsychological neurocognitive evaluations over the past year have been remote for research studies. What you see here is a picture of one type of a remote assessment where you have an examiner remotely on a laptop uh, working with somebody, working with a patient who has an iPad in front of them and they're being asked to do things on the iPad and that information is being transmitted back to the examiner at the remote site. And that's one way that assessments can happen. There are other ways as well. So what I'm going to do is just talk about some of the general concepts first and then how we've been implementing them locally in Rochester where I'm based. Um, the first thing that we started to think about was what the remote site would look like. In most cases, it has been the home location for the subject, but in some cases it might not be. We know that most of our children with rare diseases also have special needs that have thankfully allowed them to continue in school during the day full time rather than be pushed to a virtual school model. And for those individuals, maybe the study site is a location at their school or is at the clinic where they get their local ongoing care. Um, but for us, for the most part, it has been the home location. Whatever the location is, that's the remote assessment. What we're really thinking about is that that is a study site. And just like any study site, you should do a site survey to determine whether it's feasible to do research activities at that location and what types of activities can be done feasibly in that remote, concept, remote context. And so the first thing we do is we've taken a look at what assessments are already available that are perhaps off the shelf that are normed for distance administration that were already built to be given remotely. And you can think about that across the different domains of assessments that are available. So observer reported outcome measures. One example, this is certainly not the only, is the violent adaptive behavior scale. So that's a questionnaire that is filled out by a proxy rater, like a parent or a caregiver or someone else who knows the, the patient well, and is designed to be given, or one of the ways it's designed to be given is remotely via phone or via paper, and also more increasingly through uh, virtual platforms. Patient reported outcome measures traditionally have been things that you just hand to a patient and they fill it out themselves. It's a questionnaire. And those historically have been very easy to deliver remotely via phone or mail and have been done that way for years. And then there have been some instruments over the years that perhaps might have been initially developed for in-person assessment, but even pre-pandemic were being 
modified and moved to remote options. And I think this is not uncommon in rare diseases. Even before the pandemic, those of us who do rare disease research were just grappling with the realities of the patient populations we serve. They're geographically dispersed around the country and around the world. And because of the rare disease burdens that they carry, travel may be challenging for physical reasons or behavioral reasons or other reasons. And therefore, we've had to be creative for many, many years in ways to assess people where they're at. We also started to look at criteria for when summer all of a remote visit wasn't feasible. And to really do that a priori rather than in the moment try to figure out from visit to visit or measure to measure whether something couldn't be done in the moment so that we had some way to document and track why we were making the decisions we were and to do that in a systematic fashion. So some of those concepts, what was the remote, what was the assessment that we were choosing? We then would do a very careful technology review of the site and review the physical built environment of the site as well. And in doing that, help to prepare study participants and caregivers for what they could expect. And that would include making a plan for how we would get materials to the site and back from the site, from the, from the patient's home. Um, that technology review has turned out to be really important. And in Rochester, we've done that by having a pre-visit appointment where we make sure that all of that is working smoothly. So we make sure that people have the equipment that they need. If they need a webcam or an internet enabled device so that we can link with them, we do that technology test visit and we make sure that that test visit tries to emulate as closely as possible the environment and the timing of when the actual study visit will happen. And that includes making sure it's in the same location so that the internet service is the same even that it's in the same room and at the same time of day so that we know what the lighting and the sound is going to be like for the time of the visit. We want to take a look and have the parents or have the family show us what the environment looks like where the study visit will be taking place to make sure that it's a safe space for that to happen. Uh, our evaluations include physical assessments, including some requests for patients to walk, to assess their gait. We have some tests of balance and strength and mobility. We wanna make sure that the environment that they're living in is a safe place for us to ask them to do that. Um, and that the activities can be performed safely with the people who are around them. When patients come for an in-person visit, the built environment really is designed to protect the privacy and the confidentiality of the research subject. They come into a private room, information that's collected about them is collected in that private space and the records are kept in a locked office, in a locked filing cabinet and all the rest are in, in secure electronic spaces. When we're doing in-home visits, we also have to consider these things and maintain the private, privacy and confidentiality of individuals and their data. And so we really do think about that a lot and make sure that if we're recording a visit, that what's being recorded is only what's necessary for the research. Something that has been, I think, both a boon and a challenge has been the rise in psychological assessment of the available electronic assessment. So many of the psychological test vendors have, have developed bespoke cloud-based systems for administering tests and scoring tests. And that's been wonderful for remote evaluation. That's extended to some performance-based assessments like some of the IQ measures and other cognitive assessments and for things like the Vineland, which can be quite cumbersome to do on paper or via interview um, if you're just doing them um, without those electronic supports. But the challenge has been that not all of those systems are FDA Part 11 compliant. And that's the part of the regulations which has to do with the validation and sort of integrity of electronic data and electronic data capture. And so for any clinical study that's going to be FDA regulated, you have to take a careful look at what those vendors can offer and make sure that they can be compliant with the regulations. One final comment I'll make about pediatric assessments is that, as Julie had mentioned at the beginning of our section, what we're doing is we're asking children to really give us um, the same behavioral repertoire that they were able to give us before, even though we've changed a lot of the rules of engagement. And even so far as adding things like masks and PPE, 
which they may associate with medical procedures and have medical trauma over. So there are some advantages to bringing some of these assessments into the remote environment, but at the same time, there are other challenges in that remote environment that can also um, be threats to validity. Um, when I do testing in person, I want to make sure that the evaluation I give the child is the most interesting thing in the room so that they're going to pay attention to the tests I present. When I have to compete with the toys in their bedroom or the video games that are happening in their living room, that's a bit of a challenge. And so part of that pre-visit assessment is making sure that we can identify a space in the home at a quiet time of the day when we can do that evaluation. The other thing that happens is when children or adults travel to a research site, they have protected time and the only job they have is to participate in the study visit and to give their all to the study activities. But when we see people in their home, we're catching them after a day of school, after a day of work, they may be tired, they may be distracted because of just the everyday demands of their day. And so we have to really think about that as well and be flexible. And so we've started to move to some study visits on weekends because that has worked well for children who have busy weekdays and parents who have busy weekdays as well. The last thing I'll say here is that it's awfully helpful whenever you have a research participant who might need some tech support, not just for children, but for adults as well, to have somebody available on standby if they need assistance during the evaluation. And we also try to have a backup plan in place, such as having a phone number that we can call in case there are any unexpected tech issues that arise on the day. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Julie just to do a quick summation, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you, Heather. So, you know, I, I like the title of the slide. Why does all of this matter? Why have we uh, had so many meetings about this and so many discussions? And, um, you know, my co-panelists and I are uh, so interested in, in having further discussion um, with the audience. You know, COVID-19, we're all well aware, painfully aware that it's, it's forced this brand new way of life in every nook and cranny of the lives we have. Um, and new ways of conducting science, new ways of conducting patient care, new ways of carrying out clinical trials. And this conversation is really about um, conducting these in reliable, valid, and safe ways while um, you know, being mindful of the, the many sources of error variance in this science and care, um, and, and really just sort of being mindful of all the different modifications, adaptations, and accommodations that we've employed, uh, what's been most effective. We want to learn from others about what's been effective for them, um, introducing the least possible um, inevitable error variants, um, but really striving to reduce and control those to the extent possible um, while creating a positive experience that allows us to gather, you know, valid data, um, helpful data, and, and provide effective care in uh, the current circumstances. So thank you. I'll, I'll pass it on. All right. Thanks, Julie. Um, so thank you to my presenters. So I'm actually going to ask all of the presenters to please turn your cameras on, and we're going to begin answering questions from our audience. So just as a reminder, please raise your hand and the host will unmute your line. When you hear two beeps, please state your name, affiliation, and then you can proceed with your question. So we'll give folks a chance to, to raise their hands if they have any questions. And I guess as folks are getting um, their questions lined up, uh, I'll start with a question for, for the group here. And I, what are some of the silver linings that you hope to see continue past the pandemic? And any of you could take that. <laughs> no, I'd love to comment on that. <clears throat> um, you know, what we've found is that uh, certainly children and, and, and their families that when the, when the rare conditions involve major mobility, physical impacts, when there are major behavioral impacts, um, all of those things that have classically restricted travel 
um, and made travel a major burden pre-pandemic, these people had major barriers to access coming to major centers for evaluations, care, participation in trials. And I think this has forced all of us to think more inclusively about mm -hmm. extending these assessments and care out to, um, you know, past that. Um, so I, I think that's one really, really important silver lining and one that I plan to carry forward. I know my colleagues do as well. I would absolutely echo that. We've had people participate in our research who never would have um, been able to come to Rochester and we never even knew we're out there. And now we're contacting us because they know they can have access to us in different ways. And I think a, a major uh, strategy that we're going to benefit from moving forward is really the resources that have been developed by some of our vendors. And so when we look to some of the vendors we use for training um, clinical sites on administration of clinical outcome assessments, they now have developed these great materials that allow expert consultation via Zoom to help tertiary sites that maybe don't have as much administrative experience to administer these um, clinical outcome assessments, which in turn is going to support families from having to travel all the time so far. So even if they can get more of their assessments done in their local setting, and we have the ability to train those local raters, I think that's a huge win. Um, and so I think that's a, a really big benefit. And the second thing um, Adam touched on a bit is really, we have had some incredible ad boards with caregivers um, that we've split over two days and been able to elicit the parent perspective without asking them to travel and navigate all the complexities of traveling when they have a child that has some special needs. Um, so we could break it up into two four hour sessions and split them one week apart. And um, I think that's been a huge benefit for us. And we've been really pleased with some of the ad boy that we've been able to develop. So. I I think as well, one last comment on it is that uh, it's, I think will push us as a field to really think about the assessments that we're using and are these functional, are they representing what's functional for the families? Um, and I think this is a really unique opportunity for that, so. Wonderful. It's good to know something good, but positive can come out of the pandemic. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I see we do have some hand raised hands raised. So um, it looks like the first question is from Dan DeBonis. Hi, yes, uh, Dan DeBonis from Signet Health. Thank you. This was this was terrific in um, something that um, our group and many others have been grappling with. Um, I guess one comment I was struck by the, the um, I can't remember which one of you presented it, but it was really excellent, the, the, the picture of the uh, pig child smiling, doing an assessment, and the other one with their mask, and it's, again, I think a point that that, that um, not, I'm not sure everyone's thinking about, but my main question was about equivalence, and is there a benchmark that you might use for, let, let's say, defining equivalence between a scale that may have been validated uh, as a face-to-face -face versus a um, one that's being now administered by video or telemedicine? I also want to take that. I mean, I, I can, uh, I'll take a stab, but I don't really have the answer. I mean, I think in order to know whether something is equivalent, you have to have enough data to really know that, that it's comparable and you'll have to have close enough, you know, within childs and within raters, you know, that, that it's really equivalent. So I think, you know, I can just speak for our own experience, which is the key question is, do we feel that we can rigorously assess the concepts that are covered by these particular assessments and the domains that are important? Um, you know, we, we hope that there might be enough overlapping in-person assessment data with remote data that we have a general sense of how comparable, but to really do it rigorously. And I know the folks on this panel are really the, the, <laughs> the world's experts in this is, you know, you, you really need to have the same rater assess the same child remotely and in person 
in a period of time over which you don't think the disease is going to, you know, significantly change. So I think it's very hard, unfortunately, to have a great answer to your question. But um, there, there is some, there, there are some tests where um, there is some sense of uh, being able to address the concepts similarly via uh, remote training. And there, there are some tests that, as uh, I think it was either Heather or, or Julie mentioned. Um, like the Vineland, where, where you can kind of give the questions remotely. But uh, I don't know if any of my other colleagues have uh, other perspective. I, I would say that I don't think it's an all or nothing decision and that at least when we've thought about it in our location um, and with the populations that we study, we've really sort of categorized or put into bins the types of assessments we do based on different sort of types of rigor that could be applied. So, you know, at the top of the pyramid, I guess, are the assessments that really are fully robust for remote assessment because they were designed to be deployed in that fashion or they were designed to be deployed either, um, you know, remotely or in person. And so that um, reliability testing has already been done. And, and you can say that, you know, the, the sorts of data you're going to get back, um, the sorts of scores you're going to get back are similar or the same. And then after that, we've taken a look at what types of assessments maybe were designed for in-person evaluation, but are robust for remote evaluation because of the demands of the test. So uh, one of the populations that I do a lot of my research in is uh, the various different forms of bat disease, different genetic forms of bat disease. And this is um, for, many for many of the different forms, vision loss is a primary early symptom, but at, while verbal skills are retained for a period of time. And so we, over the years have been giving assessments that don't require vision and don't require manipulatives, uh, but, are, but are assessments that only require somebody to be able to listen and give a verbal response. So if you can create an, a home environment that is quiet and free of distractions and to the extent possible can emulate the in-person room where you might do that testing, those might be the sorts of assessments that would be reasonably robust to a remote evaluation because the demands for the test and the, and the domains of function being measured are not different um, even though the, the, the testing is happening and being delivered through a different modality. And then next down, I think in, in that pyramid would be the things where there's some aspect of the test or some aspect of the domain of interest, which somehow is being modified by virtue of the remote assessment taking place. And then you have to figure out a way to work around. And that I think is where the most rigorous revalidation has to happen. And I think to add on to, to Heather's point as well, uh, we are always reevaluating our endpoint model and looking at which measures are we the most comfortable with at this point in time that given COVID that are reliable and valid? And so maybe that means repositioning something like the Vineland in a different place in your endpoint model because you feel really comfortable that that is an important measure at this point in time. And then the second thing I think is, is we've, we had planned all along to do daily activity video assessments in the home environment but those changed in terms of their importance. And then we looked very extensively at how we would be able to use those videos and feel really comfortable that there wasn't bias present by having multiple raters rate the same videos. And so I think that's a new layer of discussion for us and a new level of importance um, because of some of the challenges we came into related to neurodevelopmental testing. You know, Dawn, as you mentioned that, it occurs to me that there's um, another layer that I hadn't even thought about before, which is not just the type of assessment or the mode of delivery, the method that the assessment's given, but the content. So, so much of the a child's or a person's content experience has changed over the past year. You know, I'm involved in a study right now where we have planned to do a lot of assessment of social function, but children aren't spending time in lots of peer activities or the typical peer activities that they that they engaged in before. And so even though the assessments we chose are valid for um, a remote method, their questionnaires, parent questionnaires, the content really doesn't apply in the same way anymore. Mm -hmm. And yes, also, and to, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Julie. Well, to that point too, and when I'm, I'm listening to you guys discuss this, um, you know, I think also, the 
rare diseases are so diverse, right? And the aspects of disease that matter the most to those rare communities are also diverse. And so when we think about, you know, uh, you know, validation standards and, and what's comparable and what's not, that actually might depend on disease presentation because for diseases that have um, very significant neurobehavioral manifestations um, and there are, you know, a component of that is communication concerns, the interaction of the behavioral manifestations and the decline in communication might make it much more challenging to assess that in a remote capacity versus a rare condition where there's the, the decline in communication abilities, but uncoupled from the level of behavioral manifestations. So when we think about the validation comparison, that's also going to be disease specific. And, and when we think about um, sort of necessarily adjusting, uh, you know, the order of analyses and, and how uh, rigorous are these um, these measurements. We also have to think about, uh, you know, how much of these endpoints going to be clinically meaningful too, um, and and not just in clinical trials, but then in clinical care. How much of these are really going to be very helpful to the care of the patient and the family? So know your know your condition very well. That's always that's always the, right. That's the first thing we always do. Right. Dan, did that, that did that address your question? You know, it, it does. It's a really tough topic, and that's that's kind of why I asked if there was kind of a, a minimum standard that you thought of. But I, I mean, it's they're so diverse that it's really hard to give a pinpoint. But I appreciate you know the, the thought that goes into it. I mean, I, I also think you know there are certainly obviously statistical tests that you can run on kind of the assessments that were done remotely versus in person, um, but. I think it's hard because, as Adam was mentioning, we're not, in these environments. You're not able to do that in kind of a controlled, randomized way. So it's I would think of it maybe a little bit more as sensitivity testing um, to see if there's a, a big difference there statistically and kind of you know scores that were remote. You you know you're consistently ten points higher or something like that, um, just to kind of get a feel. But it, it may be more of a feel than a hard cut off. <laughs> Uh, because the data may not be present and, you know, we didn't design these trials to be run to, to test the equivalence of some of these assessments. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think when you see you have a sort of more homogeneous population, it might be a little easier, but it, and, and that's something we're seeing. But uh, yeah, no, this is, I, again, appreciate all the effort that went into this. It's, um, it's terrific. All right, well, we have another question now from Lauren Weintraub. Yes, I was wondering whether you guys have um, experienced issues, uh, COVID related issues with uh, study coordinators um, and, you know, their own um, uh, responsibilities, changes with, you know, um, home schooling and availability turnover in study coordinators and then how that affects, you know, all of this testing. Um, uh, excuse me, training that you have to do, and then you have to retrain someone. So if it's taking longer and you have to keep retraining people, having backups, um, I didn't know. I was wondering um, if you've experienced that. And and then I had a second question um, that just popped to mind, which is uh, you had meant somebody had mentioned, or a couple of you had mentioned having local uh, test givers um, that maybe are qualified. How do you go about finding uh, those people? Um, you know all over the world, potentially, um, uh, you know, if people can't travel. Well, I can maybe ask a couple of those questions. Um, you know, just through experience in the rare disease community, we definitely have identified a couple of raters that have more flexible schedules. I think it has to be raters that more have the ability to work in private practice. Um, that can travel and go to multiple different sites or do home assessments, et cetera. So we just through years of experience identified a couple of people that had flexibility to do that type of testing. Um, but still, even if you identify those people, we still want consistency in the same raters doing the same assessments over time. So we have to set up a model of them doing the repeat assessments. 
Um, related to your study coordinator, uh, yes and yes and yes. We've had uh, PIs and study coordinators and raters, and um, it's just we've had to be flexible in retraining. I think um, our best approach in training is absolutely to train more than one raider at a time and to get uh, them both trained in the same approach um, and to be reliable with each other so that when life happens, you have alternative um, plans or ways you can administer your assessments. And we just had to open up our, our time points related to what was acceptable for scheduled assessments because inevitably, you know, it could have been we had a COVID exposure and they had to leave. Um, it could have been somebody had COVID themselves. It could have been they were taken away to COVID related uh, work within the hospital, all of those things have happened to us. And so our, our data analysis and our dissemination was no doubt delayed and we just had to continue to be flexible. So I don't know if there's any one specific sure thing that gives you the guarantee that that's going to be easy. I would echo what Don said too. We've been having the same issue at some of our sites where you know, one clinical evaluator has a, a an exposure or a positive test, and then that really just shuts you down. And so you kind of be flexible with those those timelines. I think expanding um, that window of, of visits, I think, is a really important one. So we we've um, fortunately not lost coordinators because they've you know moved on to other things during the past year due to the pandemic, but. We certainly recognize that for research coordinators and for all of the other frontline members of our study team that, you know, the burnout can be real and that, you know, the added stresses of engaging with patients during this time is something that has to be considered. And so we've just been talking about that as a lot as a team to make sure that everybody's seen and taken care of in the, in the best way possible. I think the other thing that we're finding at our institution broadly, we're a hospital, we're a medical center, is that um, although there are a lot of positions open, not just as research coordinators, but for other hospital staffing positions throughout the institution, um, there's been kind of a reduced uptake of those positions and fewer applications coming in. And our general perception is that um, folks have been nervous to come work in a healthcare setting because of risks of exposure to COVID. So many people have gotten accustomed to having opportunities to work remotely or to find jobs that allow them to minimize their exposures and their contacts. And it's becoming hard to ask people to come into a hospital and work in a hospital. Although I have to say, I feel safer any, you know, I don't feel any safer anywhere than at the hospital. This, is, this feels like the safest place to me to be, but um, that's not everyone's perception. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an additional mitigation strategy that we implemented. And for sites that have a lot of stress and a lot going on, we definitely did what we called like more controlled communication, meaning um, five different people cannot send an email to that study coordinator in a given week. It should come through one person and we should coordinate our communication and be really clear about the asks that we have um, and what the impact of those asks are going to be upon. Um, is it necessary or is it ideal? And um, really trying to decide when you can rein those requests in and how they can all come from one person. Um, or maybe even it means you have one meeting with that site and you ask all of those things at the same time. Um, so that has been an ongoing issue for us related to the stress that our sites are experiencing. A great point, Don. Okay, I see there's one final question here from Donna Sparta. She sent it in via chat, so I'm hoping she'll be able to, to speak to that. Don, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. So we have a, a trial currently taking place and our site is trying to reduce the travel burden on the family. So they want to see if they can stay at the site location for approximately 26 days. And, um, you know, we understand the circumstances for rare diseases and, and that, um, you know, there's more leniency with that. But we were just wondering what your experience has been on extended travel um, rather than, you know, having the, the family 
travel back and forth uh, to conduct, you know, every two weeks um, visits, they, they would instead stay at the location and stay, you know, in a, a hotel or in an apartment. And we were just wondering what your take is on that. You know, there was certainly, oh, sorry. Did I start speaking over someone else? <laughs> just, it's a little bit of a sound delay. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so, you know, earlier in the pandemic when um, we really didn't have great testing, right, um, for COVID, families would come and they'd have to quarantine, right? They would travel and then they would have to quarantine in state to, to until they, you know, could prove that they just didn't develop symptoms before participation. So, so that extended stay was, was certainly a piece of it. Um, you know, it sort of depends on, it, it depends, this is what neuropsychologists are famous for saying, but um, it, it really does. It depends, the burden depends on what the, what the family circumstances are, what the needs are. Um, you know, certainly in talking with members of the, the rare community, some people have said, uh, you know, this is a direct quote, being, participating in clinical trials is not for every family. Right, even if there's the potential of a disease modifying therapy, um, people recognize that that it's really hard to do, um, and it can be that burden. And so there's there's weighing that against um, the prospect of of disease change and and what those changes are, um, and also the clinical care. You know, seeing a specialist. So um, so we've certainly had it, and we've certainly had families um, whether it just fine. Uh, other families have expressed the challenges that they've had, and um, still others who have, have declined. So I would say the, the ones who I've been able to interview about their experience are going to be a biased sample, but, but they've done okay. Yeah. So further to Julie's point, I would add as a study site uh, for the study coordinator and the PI and the sponsor, you need to be incredibly clear about what the expectations are in this family um, before they travel related to how long they will stay, what that will look like. Because especially if you're bringing a child from another country to enroll in a clinical trial, the expectation cannot be for them to go back and forth. And what does that look like and how long will they be required to meet all of the um, required protocol assessments for this clinical trial and, and allowing the time to have those really in-depth discussions for the family to prepare for what that looks like um, is a really important thing. And that will help you be much more successful and the families to be much happier through the process because it's, it's an incredible burden to participate in some of these trials. We've been talking about our process for gradually reopening to in-person visits and really have been thinking about how we can give families a red carpet experience when they come here. And I think we have always done a good job in helping folks to have good travel experiences to our site to participate, but we really have to um, go above and beyond now to make sure that people are comfortable and are safe and don't feel stressed about the travel. Um, I think particularly for children who have neurodevelopmental disabilities, it's already hard to travel and cope with jet lag and symptom burden and still be able to do your best on neuro, neurobehavioral assessments. And then to add to that the added stress and perhaps, you know, physical hoops to jump through to come at this time. We, we really want to make sure not just that the, the travel goes smoothly, but that when people arrive that they feel, um, you know, fresh and energized and really feel able to participate at their best. Okay, well, I see we're actually out of time, but thank you, Dawn, Kira, Heather, Adam, and Julie, and thank you everyone for attending today's Pediatric COVID-19 Mitigation Strategies Workshop. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact either myself or Barb on the slide here. Our email addresses are here. Um, and on behalf of the PRO Consortium's Rare Disease Subcommittee and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.